for another opportunity to come before the Lord and uh, worship Him and let His truth uplift us, strengthen us, and continue to guide us uh, towards our ultimate destination to be with Him for all of eternity. What a blessing that um, no matter all the, the things that we go through in this life, that we can have our minds centered and live with that kind of consistency in our, our attitude and our faith. And uh, we face challenge, challenges every day, and those challenges um, never seem to go away. And so we're very grateful um, for lessons like this. I, I'm very, very grateful uh, for this particular book. I, I remember distinctly um, when I was in high school, uh, maybe senior, senior high school, um, where it, the peer pressure that we talk about, and we know it's real. And I uh, was no stranger to that. And, and it's very, very difficult when you know the validity of the truth that is lodging in your heart, and yet you know that ultimately there can be a price to pay for choosing that, that path. And this book was a book that I, I went to quite often um, and still do, and it never ceases to do what it's intended to do to uplift us, to strengthen us, to help us tap into that level of strength that sometimes we don't know how to, how to attain it, how to tap into it. And hopefully this can be a help for all of us. And um, it's just a, it's a great lesson in that. As I was reading uh, again this chapter, couldn't help but think, I remember, um, maybe some of you are familiar with it, there was a, a, a group when I was in school, when we talk about peer pressure, there was actually positive peer pressure. Uh, when I was in maybe fifth, sixth grade, I uh, couldn't wait to get my t-shirt, said just say no, and I was in the club and I had the button, and we were all, all about saying no to the pressure of drugs and the pressure of uh, all those things that, that were uh, on the rise, and while we felt great about all the camaraderie and we were all encouraging each other to just say no, uh, I appreciate those days and appreciate certainly the message of that, but one thing that's evident is that we hopefully do learn through life is it's great when you have a lot of people surrounding you to say no to things. It's great when you ha are surrounded by that kind of encouragement. It's very, very hard to say no when you don't have anybody in your corner. It's very, very hard to say no when it seems like you are literally the only one. So if you are saying no to these things. And, and that's where this uh, lesson certainly can be an encouragement. Uh, for me, as I grew up, um, again, not only did I have my mother teaching me uh, and reading me these lessons, um, grew up very thankful for uh, the preaching and the teaching that I remember I had, particularly uh, my grandfather uh, was one who loved to preach from this text. And um, I know I usually always bring this particular one up. He would, he would always bring it up whenever he would preach about this text. And uh, as I become to be more fond of him and miss him very dearly, I almost can't help but just bring it up, and so I uh, apologize. I hope you'll indulge me. Just to, you, know, you probably heard me tell the story over and over again, but uh, always uh, uh, encourages me to think about him in this way. He would always tell us the story of how he had to face that challenge of saying no. He was in the army, and he had a very good friend who uh, was an Indian, and he was a very, very uh, tall. Uh, uh, large uh, individual. My grandfather's very small, uh, not much to him, uh, physically wise. And uh, one day the Indian was having his little spiritual ritual, which involved some very, very strong drink uh, that he was pouring for himself. And, and he considered it an act of honor. So he wanted to share this ritual with my grandfather, let him know this friendship he felt he was honored to have. And my grandfather just politely said, no. Um, I, I, I'd rather not, um, striving to try to um, be aware of those kinds of influences. Uh, my grandfather grew up uh, very often barefoot. Uh, yes, he grew up in West Virginia, so certainly what's the difference between that? But he just couldn't afford the shoes. Uh, all of the money in their household went to uh, alcohol. 
and the money was always spent on another bottle and another bottle, and they didn't have much growing up. And so my gra grandfather saw that how easy it could be for that to take that hook, and so he didn't want to have that. So he just he said no. And this was a, a, a great insult to the Indian. And the Indian kept pursuing and persisting and persisting. And at one point, he actually grabbed him by the throat, opened up his mouth, poured the liquor in his mouth. And I remember get this image of my grandfather just spitting it out and actually winning uh, <laughs> over this man who respected him for holding to those um, ideals he was wanting to be consistent with. And... Uh, that's hard to do. <laughs> and so I always appreciate it even for him to encourage us to say that if we strive uh, to dig down deep and to find that strength, we can strive to do that. Um, but this is, the, this is the lesson for us. And it's truly amazing when I think about this, this scene um, because there was a lot of this peer pressure going on there as well. And that's what we find. We find... Essentially, that everybody is literally going to be doing this act of bowing down the minute you hear all this sound of music. And what's truly amazing about what it is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say no to is initially they're saying no to intimidation. They said no to intimidation. Because that's really what was being used. Notice it says in verse 2, of Daniel chapter 3 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Notice verse 6. When I read verse 6, one pa another passage pops into mind. It's that there is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. What we are seeing in, essentially in our culture has been done over and over again. And notice what they did. Essentially they say, they give them an ultimatum. This is what we want everybody to do. And if you don't do it, we will literally crank the heat up on you in a literal way. Verse 6, but whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Uh, amazing. In other words, we're not even going to give you a choice. I, I mean, you can make the choice, but really, who's going to choose that? <laughs> who's literally going to choose suicide <laughs> over just do what we tell you to do? Just, just, just do, just follow along, and everything will be fine. Intimidation is essentially what they chose to get this accomplished. Do it or else. And make it, we're going to make life so difficult, we're going to crank the heat up on your life. We're, like, we're just going to put you in this furnace, and you are going to face the consequences. And notice verse 7, it says, Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, notice all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down. It works. This works. That's why they did it. They know this works. No, no negotiation, no debate, no, uh, uh, let's, let's, let's hear your side. Oh, no, no, let's hear yours. No, no, none of that. No, that, that'll take hours. That can take weeks. I know, I know a quicker way to get this done. We'll just put a intimidation and tell everybody, here's the consequence. And notice what everybody did. Oh, okay, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah bow down. <laughs> you, heard, you heard the music. As soon as the music plays, everybody does it. And what truly is amazing, what truly is astounding, is in the midst of all this, there are three, three individuals who said no, said no. What are they saying? They're saying no to intimidation. 
They're saying, no, that, that doesn't equate into our thinking. We don't respond to that. There is something, there's a higher ideal that we're, we're reacting to, and it's not intimidation. And it says for in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, For this reason at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar, the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and, and all kinds of music, is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are, here we come, the tattletalers. <laughs> Guess what, king? <laughs> Those guys <laughs> aren't doing it. Two things that are really pathetic. One is intimidation, and two is a <laughs> tattling, tattling on the people who aren't following along. <laughs> it's like, what is this, third grade? <laughs> no, this is real life. <laughs> this is serious stuff. <laughs> and it is, and it's amazing. This is how grown <laughs> thinking people who can, as Andy Griffith said, can drive a car and everything. <laughs> <laughs> actually sometimes allow their, their minds to be influenced by this kind of quote-unquote logic. Just brute force, <laughs> just do it or else, and we'll find you out if you don't do it. And we'll tattle, and we'll tell, and we'll make life difficult for you. And they did that. A bunch of people saw them not doing it. <laughs> and that's what they did. In verse 9, it says, They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, sword, and back, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O oh king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. And then something else that we see that is really just hard to see again, but we, we, we fall to it, vanity. Vanity. Simply what it is, he got mad because they wouldn't bow down to his image. <laughs> got mad because three guys wouldn't bow down to the image of him. <laughs> and, and again, a respect of just how, how big the ego can become. How large we can allow how we view ourselves and what we want others to do. And, and again, and in many ways, what we're seeing is the idolatry of just our own worth and our own arrogance and our own sense of what we believe everybody needs to do exactly as we say all the time or else. But there's these three guys who just don't operate that way. And he gets in a rage. In, in Daniel chapter 3 verse 13 it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar in, in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true? Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. The second thing they said no to, they said no to negotiation. They said no to negotiation. That's exactly what this is. Interesting, maybe, maybe people might wonder, well, doesn't this seem to contradict a passage in Peter that actually says we should give an answer? 
Remember, doesn't Peter say that? Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Well, yes, we give that answer when they ask why we don't do this. That's the only way it leads to an effect on giving a hope is if we say we don't need to explain ourselves. Now, the reason why this is negotiation, why we shouldn't have to give into this, because what this essentially is, is pressuring people to say, we'll go ahead and give you another opportunity. And the negotiation usually goes like this. We'll give you another opportunity. But do you really, do you really believe that these ideals you believe in can absolutely hold any sway or actually do any good for you? They're basically begging or, or, or uh, uh, pulling them into, a, into a, a bet, so to speak, or an intimidation situation to say, we're banking, we're basically saying, good luck. Good luck. Th that's how he ends the negotiation. Did you catch that? Notice he, well, maybe, maybe you just haven't considered. I'm going to give you another opportunity that when you hear all this, that you can go ahead and give. But notice what he says. He says, now here's, again, the consequence. <laughs> here's the consequence. You will be thrown into the fiery furnace. And notice what he says. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands. Often there can be this temptation that we will say no to intimidation so long as we can explain ourselves. Because then there's the temptation that says, well, I will go ahead and do this so long as, as uh, you accept me. They even said no to that. It was, it was not up for negotiation. Will you accept me? It was not up for negotiation. Will you still look at me favorably? It was, we don't care. That, that has nothing to do with our idea. It has absolutely nothing to do with how you look at us. And often there can be that sense where there's a temptation to say, well, let me, let me explain to you why I'm choosing this. That itself is an idol. That is the idol of safety. I will make this decision so long as I feel safe and you look at me in a favorable light. So let me give you the opportunity. That's what he's basically saying. I'm going to give you the opportunity to change. And they say, why do we even have to answer you in that regard? In other words, our ideals are a matter of truth, which is eternal, which cannot change. But turn over to first, first Peter. In fact, this is exactly the same principle that Peter was encouraging the Christians when they were facing their uh, matters of persecution to, to, to have the same kind of reasoning and logic. In first Peter chapter one, Notice what he says in verse 17. He says, if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, notice it's obedience to the truth, obedience to ideals or principles which cannot change. He's going to mention that. He says in verse 23, For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. In many ways, what they said no to was, you can do whatever you want with us. That's not even the issue. We aren't doing this to preserve safety, I'll tell you that much. 
We aren't choosing this principle because we think it's the best thing that, that keeps us safe. We're making this decision because this is the truth. And the truth will never change. And they, they, they answered the, 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 the test. The test was, we seriously doubt that whatever this ideal you are uh, nobly stand for will last. Because you're not going to last. They chose to say, whether we last or not, we know one thing, the God we serve will stand forever. And his truth will stand forever. Which is why they said, we're not going to, this is non-negotiable. We're not, we're not affected by however you might want to make life harder or more difficult. That, that has zero impact on what made our decision. It has nothing to do with it. Which is why they said, and if God so chooses, he can save us. That's not even the question. And so we, I think it's a great lesson. Don't go into the negotiation room when it comes to standing for your ideals. The word of God is non-negotiable. The word of God stands on the truth of the eternal nature of God who gave it to us. So we don't have to give explanations to people in terms of hopefully they feel comfortable with the decisions that we make. That's what, the, that what he's dealing with here. Now, when we stand firm and we do not fear their intimidation, then, yes, Peter says, now be ready to give an answer for the hope because they're going to ask you, how could you do that? That's what Peter's dealing with. He is not in any way encouraging us to sit down and say, pretty please, would you let me, let me explain myself first so that now we can understand one another? It is no. This... This is already settled. And we are paying allegiance and loyalty and obedience to that. That's, that's what they said no to. That's what Peter said no to. First Peter, he continues on in First Peter chapter 3. Notice in verse 13, he says, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you, sh even if you should suffer... For the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. That's the position they took. The position they were taking, we are blessed whether we're in the furnace or out of the furnace. <laughs> that has zero impact on our decision. And notice he says, so when you do that, when you do that, you are blessed. And notice, do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. I have already made this decision. It's already been settled because the answer has been settled in heaven long before this conversation ever came up. And notice, and then what do we do? Always ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for why you've chosen that. Why you do not fear intimidation. Why you will not give explanations for your decisions because they are non-negotiable. And it does not rest on whether someone agrees with it or accepts it. That's powerful. And we are living in a world where everybody has to apologize for everything. Which is ridiculous. Apologize. Give an explanation. Hopefully everyone feels more comfortable about it. No! I'm not saying that we just steamroll our, our positions over everybody. No, not that. I'm saying don't be drawn to the negotiation room over your faith. Because that is also an intimidation measure that they know this stuff works. Once they get to the negotiation room, now they've got a chance to wear you down. And they saw it and they said, no. No, I'm not answering this. Why? Love well, the, the, the follow-up <laughs> answer. Because we know who our God is. We know who our God is. Daniel chapter 3, amazing. The response, Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. I don't care how mad you get. I don't care how much that face. Yeah, you go ahead. I see your angry face. You get even angrier. 
We don't need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up because we don't worship the God of safety. We worship the God of truth. Isn't that amazing? That's what's being sacrificed amongst us. Truth. The integrity for truth. And it's being negotiated. It's being intimidated. And even many people are giving up their position and actually going to this place of apologizing, explaining. No. No. Do not go to the negotiation table over your faith. And when they see that, yes, they'll ask you, how could you do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll talk about that. I want to talk about hope. And that's what we see. So they say no to intimidation. They say no to negotiation. Why? Because ultimately they've already made the choice. They've said no to fear. They've said no to fear. We see it unfolds. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What I love about that, you know, somebody's got to read between the lines and see the things that it doesn't explain, but we know based on Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego's statement. <laughs> which I think is kind of, actually kind of comical because <laughs> as the Nebuchadnezzar's face gets anger and angrier, their faces are staying the same. You can get as mad as you want. You can, you can crank that furnace as high as you want. It has, it has zero effect on us. All of these things had zero effect on them. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. And then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded. Yeah, that's when they ask, when they become astounded. What just happened? How did this have zero effect on you? And he said to his officials, now the question. This is what Peter said, get ready for this. What just happened? We're not there three people that we said. And how are they still here? Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? And here's a key point. You stay true the way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did over verse 16. And watch for the answer you get to give down in here. That's... It only comes when we don't fear intimidation and we stand strong and we don't negotiate and then we have an opportunity. God gives us that opportunity. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. You servants of the Most High God, you come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governor, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect. That's a key verse. The fire had no effect. How much so? 
I love this next description. The bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of the fire even come upon them. You know what I think when I think about this? No effect, not even the smell. Wasn't there someone who faced the unthinkable consequence and even had relatives thinking, this is the end. Because what can you do? I mean, death, that's final. And wasn't there someone who said, well, by now, he's been dead so long, by this time he stinks. The smell of death was around them. Remember what, ha- what Jesus showed? Jesus showed that he who had the power of life and death, when he raised Lazarus, do you think Lazarus would walk around and say, well, you still smell like death? It's about what this passage describes. That when they saw Lazarus, even after being thrown into the pit of death, he he comes out of the other side, not even the smell, no effect, no visible alterations, nothing that would indicate that he's still somehow, well, you're still hanging on some level of death. You still got this death. No, none of it. Not a stink, not, not a smidgen of anything related to death was on him. And it scared to death the enemies. And those amazing. You know what? I, you know what they did? They were so they were so angry by this. This is what this is what they did in John chapter eleven. In John chapter eleven, they unbind Lazarus and say, "Let him go." Verse forty-five, John eleven forty-five, John chapter eleven verse forty-five says, "Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him." But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus had done. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. We let him go on like this. All men will believe him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So they come up with a brilliant idea. The guy who raised someone from the dead, and now other people are going to believe in him. They said, We don't want to do. We'll kill him. And it's almost as if John puts that in there for us to almost laugh. He's saying, seriously, is that all you got? You're, you're going to kill the one who has the power of life and death and just raise someone who also went to death. And so that it had zero effect on them. Because that's the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel it's not that if we walk with Jesus in this life, no harm will ever harm us. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that we'll walk with Jesus and, and, and no bad thing will come upon you. No, it's even if the worst thing that comes upon you, death, is that the best you got? Is that, is that all you got? Because it has zero effect on the whole scope of our eternal existence. That's the blessing. That when we are walking with Christ, we can literally have zero fear of the worst thing that could possibly happen. And when we're living with that kind of confidence, that kind of closeness with the Lord, as Paul says, if God is for us, who's against us? What could possibly alter or change? And the beauty of this is because do what they want to the flesh, the truth, God's word remains forever. That's Peter's point. Go back there. I want to hit that one more time. Read what Peter says about why we need to have this sense of no fear. No fear. Because it's not about what, what happens to us. It's about what is happening to the truth of God's word. And it's being validated constantly by the power of Christ. But this is what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 23, he says, You have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off. That's going to happen to every faithful Christian. It's going to happen. The flower is going to wither and fall off. 
No matter how faithful we are to the Lord, it's not going to stop that. But here's the beauty of that. <laughs> is, is that the worst that could possibly happen? I mean, Paul says, oh, death, where is your, where, where did it hurt me? You know, Alice had a spill. She was riding her bike. I didn't see it. I, I, I heard a crash. I heard her saying something happened. I turned around. She's laying down. The bike's number. First, I said, oh, no. Oh, no. And she gets up, and I, I was astounded because her first thing, she says, I'm all right. <laughs> I said, one day your eyes are parried. <laughs> Do I get to hear the good? I'm all right. I looked at the blood coming down her out. I was like, you're all right. <laughs> really, she was in shock. <laughs> she wasn't all right. She was after. We, we bandaged her up, and she was hurt by it. But the reality is whatever they do to the body, whatever, whatever illness, disease, physical harm, whatever people want to do to us, intimidate us, hurt us, take away our place, the beauty is that when all those things are said and done, when we're standing with our Lord and Savior, as Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were with the Lord in the furnace, <laughs> get to say, I'm all right. What, what just happened? <laughs> and that's, that's the beauty, because it is God's truth that stands forever, and those who are abiding in the truth. That's why Jesus says, those who abide in my word, we will abide in him. And that's what Shadrach and Meshach, or Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were doing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing. They were investing in the eternal nature of God's truth, which said, regardless of whatever happens to us, we know his truth stands forever, and we're abiding in that. Or abiding in him. That's what we want to invite anyone who's with us who's never obeyed the gospel. That you would find that that's the security. That's the safety. It is literally abiding in his truth. There's a great proverb that says, buy the truth and sell it not. You put everything you have into the truth. If ever there was a basket worth putting all your eggs into, it's the truth. If ever there was something investing everything you have and going, I'm all in, it's the truth. Because the truth lasts forever, and those who abide in his truth also will last forever. So what a great lesson from these amazing, faithful individuals that when we abide in his truth, we can say no to intimidation, we can say no to negotiation, because we've said no to fear. And what a blessing that we can say no to fear because we will live forever in his presence. We're faithful for him. And anyone who's with us has never obeyed the gospel, we just encourage and pray that you can also have that same confidence, have that same fearless conviction that allows you to stay true to these principles, knowing that they will, they will reign on for eternity. Those who abide in his truth will reign on for eternity. Everything else will wither away. Everything else is going by the wayside, and it will not stand. And we encourage you to, if you have not done so, make that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins, to be baptized in water for forgiveness of your sins, and to live faithfully in him, in his truth. And if anyone who's struggled to do that, who has compromised faith, give it in to intimidation, compromise, negotiation. Here's a great example of individuals who showed us that it is worth saying no to those things because we know that God will see us through and will be there for us when everything else fails us. So why don't you come to the front and let your desire be known, how you wish to be right with God and put your, your life in his hands and his truth while we stand and sing this song together.